It's time to break down episode 14, named Day of the Machines in Transformers Generation 1, Season 2. So let's get after it. This is Energon Entries. Welcome back to Energon Entries, everybody. As always, this is your host, Matt Freitz. Hope this finds you well. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sticking with us. Hope you're having a good time listening to this content. And I certainly hope you're having a good time if you are listening back or watching back all of these episodes. And with that, let's get to the episode recap. The episode begins with Megatron and Soundwave infiltrating quantum laboratories where the world's most powerful computer, Torque 3, is housed. Megatron reprograms Torque with his personality and uses remote control circuit linker cards to control various machines remotely. As the takeover begins, scientist Dr. Paul Gates and a colleague find themselves locked in their office, realizing the dangers of machine sentience. The Autobots, alerted by Teletran 1, respond to the situation, with Optimus Prime leading a team to Quantum Labs and Hound, Skyfire, and Spike investigating Decepticon-controlled oil tankers. The Dinobots arrive to assist Prime's team, smashing through Torque 3's defenses, while Spike is captured during an infiltration of the Decepticon oil platform. Prime eventually disables Torque by removing a circuit linker card and delivering a powerful punch. At the oil platform, Megatron takes control of the tankers but is thwarted by Spike's plan to use an electromagnet against Rumble and Ravage. The episode ends with Prime rescuing the Autobots from a self-destructing platform and Dr. Gates making a humorous remark about the reliability of machines, which he quickly retracts, causing the Autobots to laugh at the ungrateful human's hubris. They open the episode talking about how Torque is America's most secret computer or whatever. And whenever they say that in this show, I actually think it's funny because Soundwave is already in the building. So for something that is the most secret thing in the entire country, The Decepticons and Soundwave not only already know about it, but they're already in the building. So I find that to be kind of hilarious because humans can never really keep their top secret inventions safe in this show. And I will say this though, as always, Megatron has a pretty cool plan and he has a pretty cool plan keeping Megatron in gun form in a guitar case. Obviously, Soundwave has a very easy time getting in places because a tape recorder or a cassette player, very common in the 80s. And so both of those things allowing them to get in, it's almost like they didn't use their usual brute force. They actually thought it through and had almost a human-like plan. So maybe a little bit of growth from the Decepticons. And the most powerful planet on the computer, whenever you see it up there, the animation was creepy as hell. I'm not going to lie to you at all. Like when you see it, you think, how can we trust that face? They certainly did not program it with a face that you could trust. But Megatron has this ability now all of a sudden to insert his personality into just about any computer. Seems very helpful, but also seems like something he should have done by now. And this is something I say a lot almost every episode, but these plans that the Decepticons come up with in these individual episodes seem like they would work just about any time. And why settle for, or why go for just the most powerful computer in the world when you could take over all of the other computers in the world? Imagine Megatron's personality, which we've seen, by the way, in the Microbots episode when they went in and all of his negative thoughts were snakes and things like that. His personality in just about any computer in the entire country, even back in the 80s, would have been disastrous. However, I do love the idea of humans in the 80s debating whether a supercomputer is too smart for humankind. And they're basically talking about what we debate about today. And this is not a political thing, but AI is all over the place. I use AI for this podcast in certain ways. I use it for other content that I do. And AI certainly has a place when it comes to being able to automate certain things that maybe would be more time consuming. But in this case, they're specifically talking about something like say, chat GPT or AI that's driving cars. And in this episode, they're debating it back in the 80s. And I think to myself in this way, Little did they know what we'd be doing with AI today in terms of the grand scale of what we use it for. So Prime's initial response is always to save the humans. So he obviously is thinking about it because they see the oil tankers, they understand that Megatron has this plan. 
And they're like, no, we need to save the humans first. And I love one of his people, Hound, coming up to him and saying, hey, you know, maybe we should actually think about what Megatron is doing with these tankers, because if he gets all this energy, he's going to win the war between us. And this is something that I think maybe gets lost on the Autobots a lot, is they obviously are better beings than the Decepticons, because the Decepticons are only after power. They only lust for taking over Cybertron. And the Autobots obviously have a more human side to them. But I think sometimes it's to their detriment. And Hound, I love it because it's almost out of character for the way that they write the Autobots in this series. And Hound's saying, hey, I actually think you're wrong. While I'm all for saving humans, I think we need to do both. I think we need to try and figure out how to stop Megatron. And Prime is kind of like, okay, I think that that's a good idea. And it's like, I think Optimus should be thinking a little bit more about this. And despite the fact that the Autobots do always win in the end in this show, I feel like they could have been back on Cybertron had they just been a little bit proactive. So I, I realize that this show is a cartoon and I realize that they write it for kids and they write it in a way to make it fun and lighthearted. But in a lot of ways, this cartoon is not lighthearted because they get into topics that, as we've discussed here, are a little bit more serious. There are a lot of consequences that we don't see that would happen if some of these things were happening in real life. And Optimus Prime, I feel like, instead of thinking about how they could, I guess, get back to Cybertron, he's constantly thinking about how to save the humans. You know what would save the humans? Get in your ass off Cybertron because they're not really doing anything for the humans other than being there and always trying to stop the Decepticons at every turn. Prime and the Autobots, whenever they respond to a distress call or what have you, they always seem to bite off more than they can chew. And they also realize that they need the Dinobots in these instances. Now, the Dinobots don't show up in every episode, but for the most part, whenever they do show up, it's because the Autobots are overwhelmed. And I asked this about certain things, but in this case, I think, why don't they bring the Dinobots with them every time? What's the downside of having the Dinobots with them? They've already sort of assimilated them into the collective. We saw that in a previous episode where they realized, hey, you know what? You guys can actually roam amongst us in the Ark. First of all, we've never actually seen them roaming in the Ark, but why wouldn't they bring them? They're always there. Just bring them in case you need them. Instead of getting yourself in trouble, you could actually go and maybe have the upper hand for once. Just a thought. And in the past, Grimlock's attitude would have seemed negative to me. Like I would think he's cocky and I probably said that on this podcast, but at this point, it's a body of work thing. He's looking at Optimus Prime and thinking, you always need me. You always call me to fix this stuff because they don't change what they do. And that's why I say, maybe just bring them next time. So Megatron's plan as part of taking over Torque was to use all these machines and control them. And we know this with the chips and the oil tankers and everything. And by doing so, though, obviously this supercomputer that they've built, the most powerful, the most secret computer and all that, they have all of these tanks and other vehicles that they have there that I, I would understand would be part of America's national defense. And so by using these against the humans and having them get destroyed by the Autobots, Megatron's actually doing double damage here. Not only is he taking over a supercomputer, but he's also depleting humans of what I know costs billions of dollars to make in terms of defenses. And so I think that's also very smart, but you don't see this in terms of the overall consequences as we go on in the show, but it was something that I thought of as I was watching it. And of all the OG Autobots, Hound definitely has to be one of the most overrated because you go over to the oil tankers, him and Skyfire and Spike, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And I say that he's one of the most underrated because he's obviously very useful. In this episode alone, he has told Optimus Prime, hey, maybe we should do both. And if he hadn't said that, they would have completely ignored the oil tankers. The Decepticons would have gotten all the oil, all the energy, and just won straight out. But you know, we would have saved the humans. In previous episodes, I think it was the last episode, Hound's hologram saved the day. He's actually done quite a bit for the Autobots. And so I like seeing him get this role of being sensible and calm. And he always seems to have good ideas when they need them. But again, they go to this tanker, it's two versus all the Decepticons. And it's like, how can you not think to bring more people? So Hound has a great idea of, hey, maybe we should do both. And instead of sending two equal parties, they send like three people to go take on what has to be where all of the Decepticons are. I mean, I guess they didn't know the plan outright, but at the same time, be prepared, man. But they bring Spike with them too. Why? 
why does Spike need to go everywhere with them? And he gets himself in trouble and he foils the Autobots plans and they get captured. Now they won in the end and that's fine, but it's like, Spike, stop. You just are ruining everything. And the Autobots though, if you go back to Torque, they're holding their own against these machines. But when it's time to go in and face the supercomputer, when it's time to go in and destroy Torque, Optimus Prime goes in alone against the will of all of his fellow Autobots. And this shows his leadership. He always wants to save his brothers in arms and as a leader, wants to go down with the ship, wants to save his brother, and I do like that. But he gets in there, he starts fighting, and he sees what's going on, and the most powerful computer in the world, which has the ability with these chips to control everything, has Megatron's brain, has his personality, it gets taken out by a fist. It gets taken out by one punch. And in this show, it's always the easiest thing that takes out the most complicated machines in the world. It's never something super complicated, it seems. And in this case, it's just a fist. And it's like, wow, that was way too easy for something that was given such bravado at the beginning of the episode. But going back to the oil tankers, I said that Spike ruined things and they got captured. And in order to get out, they had to use an electromagnet. They used an electromagnet in a way that was very smart. It got Rumble and Ravage to be stuck up against the wall. But then after that, Hound and Skyfire ran right by the magnet, which still hadn't lost power because they made sure to mention that it would run out of power at some point, weren't affected by the magnet. Not really sure how that works, but it certainly isn't that great of a magnet, although you could say that because of the size of Rumble and Ravage that perhaps that's why they were affected more. Megatron, whenever he doesn't get his way and whenever he loses, which is every episode, he reminds me a lot of a child that doesn't get their way when their plans break down. And maybe it's because nowadays I go through that with my four-year-old a lot and I see a lot of similarities, but this to me shows a lack of character on Megatron's part because he reacts that way. He always reacts like a petulant child who doesn't get his way. Instead of being, I guess, a little bit tougher, he comes off to me a little bit weak in those moments. He's always whining. And of course, the episode ends with a joke, and it's a joke about machines and being unreliable and so forth. Very on brand for this show, very on brand for the 80s. But like I said, the debate about AI and supercomputers in this episode was interesting because it's something that we can actually talk about now. How did I feel overall? Well, lots of action, an intricate plan by Megatron and Prime almost single-handedly got through it all by himself. I did see two animation quirks. We're gonna start talking about this at the end now. Sideswipe's head was all red at one point when it's supposed to be black and Frenzy was colored purple in certain spots, almost like they got Rumble and Frenzy mixed up. I mean, they are exactly the same except for colors. So those were some things that I saw. This was a standard episode, nothing really special about it. There's no real character building outside of, I guess, layering on top of things that we know about Optimus Prime and Megatron. But I do think that Hound was the star of the show by having great ideas and by, I guess, being real with Optimus Prime, even though your leader is your leader and he still is respecting him. Something to note though, there were no new Autobots or Decepticons in this episode. As far as I could tell, it was all OG Transformers weird because it seemed like we had been building to something. We get a two-parter coming up in the next two episodes. I'm really excited about that. We're gonna split those up. How did you feel about this episode? Have you watched it recently? I would love to know. Get in touch with me, email me, mattyicemedia at gmail.com is the way to do that. I would love to know how long you've been listening, what you think of the show, things we can do to improve, things you like, whatever. I would just love to hear from somebody out there who listens because I know people do because I look at those numbers every time I release an episode. Hope this finds everybody well. I hope this finds everybody safe as I always do. And I will talk to you next time. This is Energon Entries. Opinions and viewpoints expressed on Energon entries are those of Matt Freights and his guests and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. Energon entries is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.